We are here. <laughs> <laughs> That's the awkward part. We're just gonna wait for Meg to come on. Hopefully. Or anybody. How are you doing, Sam? I'm good. I'm That's chilling. Good. That's good. That's good. How are you doing, Lexi? Oh, I'm okay. doing. Hello. Hello. We're starting soon. Yay! Meg Grant. Okay, let's see. We've got Meg. We've got Meg. Hello! I got it to work. I'm so proud of myself. Yes. <laughs> Hello! How are you, Meg? Good. How are you, girl? We're doing good. Yeah. We're doing good. We're, doing good. We're excited about this. I'm excited love about this. I also love the glasses. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I stare at these screens all day, so, you know, I got to do something. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we can get started. Um, so basically, just to like preface this talk, um, the visibility show has been up for a couple of weeks or a few weeks, more than more than a couple. Um, and um, we want to talk to you about visibility and what it means to you and how it could relate on like a much broader context, even like within Montserrat and outside of Montserrat. Um, and we have a few questions for you. Um, awesome. Uh, so I guess we can start off with, um, from your perspective as the director of the Academic Access Studio, um, what is your experience seeing disability at Montserrat? So one of the reasons why we um, kind of thought about doing this show is this whole idea of seeing, right? Um, and seeing, especially when we talk about disability, because I think there's this... Um, misconception that a lot of times disability can be seen, but actually it can't. Um, and Stacy talked a little bit about this in her conversation, um, which everybody should watch and Aaron's too. Um, but it's these hidden disabilities. So as important as it is to bring um, visibility to every disability, um, it's especially important to the hidden ones um, because it's not always obvious. Um, and I think for me, um, I have to honor where students are when I work with them. So um, there's a long continuum of identity, no matter who we are as human beings. And I think when you add disability into part of that identity, you can be anywhere from completely rejecting it or completely accepting it. And I think that for me, it's really, really, really important to meet students where they're at. And if they don't want a single soul to know, I mean, I keep everything confidential anyways, but if they only want to work in the confines of my office, working through some of this stuff, I have to support them. But I also have to support the students who are, you know, the incorporating their disability into their artwork or trying to make change or being advocates for themselves. So I see it as kind of a very broad, I don't want to use the word spectrum, but continuum. And it's, it changes all the time. One semester could be this way, another semester could be this way. Um, but the main thing, the way I see disability, both as an individual that has a disability and um, doing what I do, um, is it's not a deficit. We really need to move away from this deficit model thinking. It's not a deficit. It's a difference. And we need to celebrate that difference. However, that person um is comfortable doing so and both are okay wherever you are in that continuum and like i said it's going to change as you go through life um hopefully because we adapt and things happen and circumstances and whatever so wherever you are in that continuum is okay yeah i really i really like that point and i think um having the the variety of artists that we got for the this visibility show um is I think it's important to see that um, there are people um, on that continuum who are comfortable or not comfortable, um, whereas somebody might be very open about their disability, some people are mm -hmm. not, and um, I think not a lot of maybe able people realize that yeah. um, disability is something that very much still has a stigma around it, so being comfortable enough to talk about it is awesome, and also not being comfortable enough to talk about it is totally fine. Exactly. I think Another point that Sai and I were talking about even just before this talk was how like 
that stigma kind of comes from just the world that we're a part of and like it's a matter of like normalizing and like realizing that there is like this broader understanding that no one's being told like and I think like visibility has been going on for like second year now um and I think it's definitely taken a much bigger step towards like trying to hit on that idea that there is like this huge misunderstanding that a lot of people have and that's like in a lot of different ways like understanding how a person might think of themselves and their abilities and also Mm -hmm. understanding other people's abilities and like the stuff that comes along with that in terms of like limitations or just how this world is set up in a way that doesn't provide for everyone. And like, absolutely, that is like, also just like, goes beyond even disabilities too, is like, that there's a lot of like, um, like gender issues and stuff and sexuality, and then even Black Lives Matter stuff going on this whole year. And I think this year is like, really like, kind of highlighted that, like, misconception and stigma towards all these like really important things that society just doesn't seem to want to acknowledge. I think a lot of that comes from this idea of normal. And I think that's the problem, honestly. Um, I won't go on a tangent, but the idea of normal is kind of bizarre, actually. Um, It comes from a a, a, a section of geometry. And we don't apply to geometry, right? We're human beings, we're adapting, we have different identities. Um, When you're mentioning all this, you know, all these um, intersectionalities of identity, I think disability is one of those ones that really can apply to almost any, you know, you can be a queer black um, person living with a disability. I mean, it's not like it's a disability does not discriminate, but what does discriminate is access to adequate health care, access to adequate education, and things like that. And I think that when we have this basis of normal, it leaves out anybody, it's putting a square peg in a round hole, right? It's not going to work. And I think that the more things are being pushed and pushed and boundaries pushed and questions answered. I think we're going to get to a point of like, what is normal anyways? There is no normal, right? Yeah, yeah, really good point. And also like what you said with, you know, disability not being a deficit is super important in the, in the context of the accessibility. Um, yep. Telling Lexi that I remember seeing um, like a metaphor for um, accessibility talking about how you know, a person who uses a wheelchair in a building that has ramps is not disabled because, you know, they they have that accessibility in a sense. Um, And disability in how society kind of views it and labels people as disabled is more so their, I guess, your worth to them. what you can do to benefit them and if you you know cannot provide some certain action or service or whatever then you're labeled as disabled and it it really does um further perpetuate that negative stigma and negative connotation that comes with disability that makes people so um so like apprehensive to talk about absolutely and I think to a favorite quote that I use, and I cannot remember the person, so I apologize, so I'm gonna paraphrase, is a a person with a disability is only as disabled in which the environment environment they're in and attitudes they're around. And I think that speaks a lot to what you're saying, Saya, is that, you know, in a situation where, because I think a lot of people have this idea of accessibility being oh, there's ramps or there's an elevator, but it goes way beyond that. It goes way beyond that, right? It goes beyond, it's acknowledging medical issues. It's acknowledging mental health, which we as a culture are not the best at doing. That is a disability. Medi- you know, Mental illness is a disability. It hasn't been covered for a very long time, but it finally is under um, protection of the ADAA. But, hey, I forgot the last day. Um, 
but I think that, you know, it's really important and to move away from the medical model, which means like there's something wrong with the person and that person has to adapt to the environment. We need to switch to the social model, which is no, there's something wrong with the social structure or the, or the building or what have you, or the attitudes. And as a society, we need to adapt. So I think that, I mean, I have great hope. Um, I'm a lot older than both of you, obviously, but you know, there was never inclusive education when I was a child and now it is the norm. It is 100% the norm and fingers crossed that, you know, people continue to vote for that to happen. Yeah, honestly, I think, like, emphasizing, like, the need for, like, the environment to be, like, more of, like, an equilibrium with, like, the people that are in it makes so much sense. And I think if people also, like, go from this video and see Stacy talk and Aaron talk about their environment and their, like, support systems surrounding their own experience as artists and just working with disability Mm -hmm. that that is like very like commonly shared among people that do have to like that's like a reality for and like I think too um like another thing that even Sai and I were talking about too which we can hit on again is just the idea that there is like this like uncertainty like unknown like defining of like who has disabilities what is a disability and what's not a disability and like how you're even having to like say like that mental illness is actually being considered like Mm -hmm. a a disability like that's kind of like well how much more do we not know that is considered like not normal you know like Mm -hmm. there is well, and I think it's ironic too, even just to like reference the show specifically, that there's like a theme of like shapes and squares that pop up in the show itself. And yep. that's like another aspect of visibility where it's like, too, even being able to see the show is really hard. So it's like, yeah. it's now it's interesting like even just in pandemic world that this is like the like the reality for art galleries right now Mm -hmm. um and just students going to school and Sina were talking too just about like remote classes and it being like more accessible for some and like Mm -hmm. actually helps others but then it's like you have to be aware like there's differences there. There's differences there. And not everyone's going to be like, kind of like conforming to that idea of like, wanting to be part of that normal. But it's like, there's like something big there that's like, really helping a lot of other people Mm -hmm. uh, with being remote, even so. Yeah, Mm -hmm. like, chiming in with that. um, um, Also, as somebody who is disabled, speaking on the remote work specifically, um, I personally have found a lot of benefit in working remotely because it, it will allows me to better, um, cope with my disability. Um, and that is something that I think that not a lot of people have talked about, like Lexi said, because people don't realize sometimes that, you know, what is working for them is not necessarily working for others and vice versa. So, while there is a lot of talk about how um, remote work is very difficult as it is, um, it is also helping a lot of people because it gives them the chance to do things on their own terms. Absolutely. I mean, when we consider, you know, 10% of Americans have some kind of chronic, chronic illness that would qualify them from a disability. So they would most likely be in that high risk during this pandemic, right? So if we say 2% of that are college age students, uh, well, typical college age students, um, that's a huge chunk of people that now are able to still carry on with their education, right? They didn't have to put a pause on it. Um, So I think it's about kind of, you know, as a teacher, because I did that for years and I do teach at Montserrat too, but um, you really do have to look at, you have to look at it through the lens of universal design 
And that's what it comes down to. And, you know, I think the language is definitely changing in the education world. Um, that universal design isn't just for um, your students with disabilities. It's for the entire population because it's some, it, it benefits everybody to have that lens. So I think, I think the remote learning, while it was definitely not a fun switch over in March, I think with time, I think um, we will learn because we're creative, resilient people to adapt um, as we need. But you know, not everything is a, not every path is linear. So there may be some bumps or barriers and that's okay. Uh, I guess that kind of leads into that, the other question that we had, which was um, how are ways that you in your position of hope to make things more accessible for students and faculty and anyone really at Montserrat that are yeah. working with disability? Um, well, it, it, it's such a hard, um, it's a hard position sometimes because I want to honor where everybody is, where they're at. Um, but sometimes that can be very difficult because students and our faculty may bring a history of, um, you know, either being ostracized or isolated or made feel less than. Um, and I have to do a lot of work with that person to realize that those were not valid, that those feelings that you had were valid, but the experience wasn't because it they didn't know what they were doing. So I have to kind of change this very negative um, negative experience into a positive one. So it's my goal constantly to make sure my office is safe and non-judgmental. You can say whatever you want to in my office. Um, you can cry as many times as you want. I could go through a lot of tissues and that's okay. Um, but, you know, I worked in public schools for 18 years. Um, I had my own experiences and I just want to make sure that students and faculty alike feel like our environment is inclusive in regards to disability. I mean, I want it inclusive in every way possible, but specifically that's my job. My job is to make sure that disability is acknowledged. Um, it is protected and supported. Um, there are laws that you have to follow. And, but what the core of my work is the people, right? It's, it's, meeting a student where they're at, whether they're like the best self-advocate and I'm just like, oh, okay, yeah, sure. We can talk about, you know, your arts or whatever, which I love to anyways, but, or it's really kind of like working through that hard, um, that hard wall that's been put up of like, it's okay. Like, I'm not like that. I'm, I'm not going to separate you from people because, you know, some, some schools do things very differently. And I think that, um, we try really hard at Montserrat to make sure that doesn't happen and that that um, negative narr narrative, that deficit model narrative does not continue. Um, but that it, it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of education. It's working with faculty. It's working with um, academic affairs. It's working with student affairs. It's, it's really working with everyone on our campus. It's working with students um, that are like, yeah, sure, we'll do this in Bear Gallery um, because it is a community effort to make sure everybody feels included. And, you know, we are definitely in a time where we need to do a lot of work on that in a lot of different areas um, on and off campus. So I think that my major focus is just to make sure that students know that what they're going through, where they are in their identity with their disability, it's okay. I'll meet them where they're at. If they don't want to disclose their disability to anybody but me, that's totally fine. And I totally accept that. If they don't want to include it in their art, absolutely, it's your choice. It's who you are. It's, you know, what you want to do with it. So I think that's my, my major thing. And then, you know, I'm always pushing for universal design. Um, either, like I have a Canvas page that faculty can join and there's a bunch of resources. I wrote a resource guide um, over the summer um, for working with students with disabilities because it is a huge spectrum. And I think people forget that sometimes. And just because somebody says, oh, I have ADHD, doesn't mean, you know, you know student A and student B are going to be the same because they're not, right? We're all individuals. So I think that I try really hard to make sure we understand where students are in, or I understand where they are. And hopefully it's my goal always at Montserrat to make sure students are their own best advocate because 
I'd be failing at my job if they didn't know how to advocate for themselves once they leave our bubble. So. Yeah, I feel like it's really like the environment to just like be like aware and empathetic to these issues is just like super important. Like it makes total sense to have like a universal system that would reflect those like values in a way too. Mm -hmm. Like I think that is like kind of incredible that you're like in that position to like be trying to make that happen. Like even just as a one person team, like that's really a lot of work. <laughs> but I'm like, also, like that visibility has like the show has like changed in a way for you to like reach out in a different way to like show yeah. like, like a new way of understanding like these ideas that you're trying to like communicate um, with like the whole school, like from alumni to students. Right. To, um, and like the more it's talked about, the more like hopefully aware and accepting people will be about it. And I think just again, like with the Black Lives Matter stuff this summer, like really like at like a peak point, I feel like really made a lot of people step back and be like, this is something that's really important that we should all be thinking about. Like, even though it's been a thing for decades already, century, mm -hmm. like, like, that's kind of like, a, I'm kind of glad that this year is like really putting people in a different perspective, yep. understand things better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, talking about accessibility and stuff too, um, sort of, sort of going into the, the topic of our next question, um, just on, in the context of um, invisible versus like visible disabilities, um, do you see, um, do you see a, like a disproportionate, um, I guess, ugh, what's the word that I'm looking for? I don't know, I guess in terms of accessibility for invisible disabilities, um, do you find that there are, um, hard, it's harder to, to make things accessible for invisible disability versus the obvious physical ones that people need? Oh, for sure, because you're relying on the individual to disclose. So that's why I keep saying I have to meet a student where they're at. Um, it's very hard because there is this misconception that disability is like a physical thing, right? I mean, I, I mean, it's getting better. Don't get me wrong. It's getting better. But I think that there is such a misconception of a lot of things. There's a misconception of medical issues. There's a misconception of mental illness. There's a misconception of autism. There's, there's misconceptions of so many different things that I think these, these hidden disabilities are very difficult to um, talk about accessibility if it's reliant on the individual. Um, hopefully that individual, wherever they may be, whether it be at work or school, the environment in which they're in is designed in a way that they're included and supported and things are accessible. So I'll give you an example. Um, so if I'm working with a student with autism um, and I know that student well, there's certain things I know that is not going to make that person comfortable, not because I'm generalizing autism, but because I've taken the time to get to know that student, but only because that student also is vulnerable with me. So it's very difficult. It, it, it's relationship building, um, which I love doing. So it doesn't, I mean, that's why I do this job. Um, but yeah, it, it's really tricky. And, you know, it's crazy to think that I looked up numbers this morning because I was kind of curious. So 61 million Americans have disability. So that's one in four people. That's a lot of people. I mean, there's one more person with us. If there's one more person, one of us would, right? So this notion of we, we just need to, to switch definition and mindset about, you know, disability is disability, period, whether you can see it or you don't. Um, but then it gets into a very long, and I will not go on this tangent, 
about um, accessibility of healthcare and things like that, especially when it comes to medical issues or if we're talking about mental illness. You know, we are in a mental health crisis for sure in this country. Um, and there's only so many psychologists, psychiatrists, and therapists that go around. Um, and I know working with students, sometimes it's a good two to three week wait, or the um, cost is so prohibitive, it doesn't happen. So it, it is hard. But I think that if we look at things through the lens of universal design, then I think we are able to make things accessible. Um, and with empathy and understanding too, but not putting not taking away dignity and also being like, oh, they did this in spite of or despite. It's like, no, they did this. They did this. And, you know, it depends on the person. And you let that person define that. You don't say, oh, they did this even though they had, you know, Tourette's or even though, um, you know, they have As Asperger's, whatever. You know, like, no, 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 that's not your story to tell, first of all. <laughs> that's their narrative. But I think that it's really important to just – just be inclusive. And <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's like, it's so natural for me, but I understand because there's so many misconceptions about it. There's so many misconceptions about, you know, what does, um, what does chronic fatigue look like? Why can't a student with chronic fatigue come to classes at class every day? Like, so there's a, there's a lot, there's a lot. And our systems that are in place in our culture aren't, aren't always, um, the most favoring to um, certain disabilities. And I think that's slowly changing with more education and awareness. Yeah, yeah. no, I think um, the idea of just like thinking in terms of like the numbers that you brought up and like thinking invisibility versus visibility, it's like, again, I feel like I even, like we've hit on this earlier um, was um, like, we really don't know how many people are invisible yeah. like I, with um, the the statistic that i found um was that 96 percent of people with chronic medical conditions have invisible disabilities yep. yeah um, that's just you know what they've been able to collect data on yeah and mm -hmm. like i think this world is just obsessed with defining and labeling and archiving this information that they they want to say is factual sometimes it's not even <laughs> you can't know yeah. because it's not it's like based off of like I don't know guessing and just just saying like it well if this is this then that means this um that's exactly right. but like the idea of like labels and having to define anything at all like that makes it so much more stressful on both ends to like it does be like well if if I'm like this, then I must be like that. Like, or mm -hmm. if, if I don't fit under that label, then I guess it's not me. But then what, then what am I dealing with? And why is this so hard for me to understand? And that's like, what makes this so much harder is like, sometimes you just don't know like what's going on. And that's scary for the person in general, but, um, I don't know, I think it brings up like this huge piece that we're missing in this world is that understanding and like making connections meet, like making ends meet, like there's this huge thing that we're missing and like, I don't know, by now it seems like we should be getting that, you know, like everyone should be, everyone has the right to like be happy and understanding and accepted by like their environment like mm -hmm. it makes it much harder when the environment doesn't reflect like what a person needs you know so like and it, yeah even and i think too go ahead i go ahead oh i was just gonna say just to give an example like with our background with making the show was like making sure there was a way for like the videos mm -hmm. that we're recording to have subtitles on them mm -hmm. that like it shouldn't be so such a hard thing to come across or come by. Like accessibility just, should be a right and it's accessible like privilege. Yeah. It should just be like a basis for everyone. But like when we're all at different places, that basis has to change where mm -hmm. like we're getting and even though it works for one person, it doesn't work for everyone. So 
But what were you going to say? I was going to say, like, it's also an interesting line that I always walk of where people are in their understanding of themselves. Because a lot of the times, students particularly, coming straight from high school, um, they were given a diagnosis that they don't, they don't even know what it means. You know, like, I, I have... I have a processing disorder. I don't even know what the hell that means, you know? So it's like, oh, okay. And, you know, that's like my jam. I love doing that. I'm like, wow. Um, Because then I'm able to be like, okay, this will help you. And this will help you. And this will help you. Hi, Eddie. Um, This will help you. And that it's really, really interesting. But it's also interesting that the line that I have to walk is, is this person choosing to maybe they want to be invisible maybe that's their choice because they have um a history of either you know being in a culture that didn't i mean it's been told to me multiple times in the four years i've been in montserrat that you know my parents don't believe that i need help and i think um or the family structure or the educational structure or the financial situation environment Exactly. And it's just, it's so hard because it's like this balance of me, like, are you conditioned to believe this? Like, are you re- like, do you do you really believe that about yourself? And so it's a lot, but I think it really speaks back to this, like, we need to kind of come to this point where visibility just means being seen. That's what I mean, that's the basic definition of the word, right? To be seen or to be able to see. That's what it comes down to. And being invisible, I don't think anybody really wants to be invisible, right? I mean, maybe certain aspects of their identity. And I understand, like, we are all shapeshifters. You know, the way I behave at Thanksgiving dinner table is going to be a little bit different than the way I behave on my Instagram stories, right? It's just sometimes how we have to live our lives. Um, Not really that different. But um, so I think it's really important to, to really take a good hard look at what we're putting out there. Um, so that's why it's so important for me to make sure, especially at Monster X, that's the confine I have right now, um, to know that students, no matter how they come to me or how they come to us as a community, that they are supported and they're seen. And that is the most important part, no matter where they are, if they have a disability or not. You know, um, I work with students, I work with every student that needs assistance and support. So I think it's important to stress that, um, they're seen and they're heard. That's really important to me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really, that's, that's a really good place. I don't know if you want to end there, but like, I'm like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, and just like, like, I think it's really just awesome to reflect on how, how much has come out of this, the visibility show just from this year, like in yep. comparison to last year. I'm glad mm-hmm. that we were able to focus a little bit more on like, like let's focus on a student, alumni and faculty yeah. person, and then mm-hmm. let's like ask them how they feel. Let's try to ask you how you feel and like have a start a conversation. And yeah. it just, the, the part that I hope that is able to come out of it is I hope that people watch these videos and listen like, and I, I will just add, too, for, like, some, uh, I don't know, motivation, but, like, the, especially the, um, the videos that we have um, of Stacy and Aaron, like, just put that on the background and just listen to I it. I know. It, yes. It goes so, like, smoothly and, like... They they ex- to listen they, to. they explain everything very like clearly and like thoughtfully and I think that if we're we can we're gonna try to find out some ways that we can make it um, we're gonna try we're gonna hopefully find ways to make it more visible to in this like world where we can't really it's like making it harder to share information yeah and on like a similar level of like importance, make it feel important when it's just on a screen. But um, I don't know, like it's where, like I definitely recommend that people like, if you get to even this point in the video, just watch those videos and 
listen to this video and like think of like how this might relate to you and your environment like and how how can we change how can we add to like a better solution for this because like there are so many big things that we still haven't figured out yet even with like in terms of like and Sai has been doing this, like, posting, like, weekly on, like, all these, like, other things that we should be thinking about, too. Like, with Indigenous Peoples Day on Monday, that's, like, yep. another thing we should be thinking about. That's another thing, like, Black Lives Matter we should be thinking about. We need to be thinking about the environment that we've created for ourselves. And, like, are we okay with that? Are we okay with that? Are we just going to, like, let it sit? For At the very least, just inform people who aren't aware of stuff like this like this genuinely just might be something that somebody has not heard of before and they might stumble across the live stream and be like oh okay. yeah well i can yeah. think about that maybe this is a thing that i can do to make this more accessible for people um yeah i think too well another point just to quickly add in there but um i've been like i'm just in this class like observing the natural world and it's like literally the teacher like read something or told us something the other day that was like sometimes it's about being silent and just listening and observing like it's you can't no one person can understand everything by talking all the time like so i think it's like you everyone needs to realize like maybe it's time for me to shut up a little meditate on this and like really question is this like the reality of everything? Am I like seeing all facets to the situation um, and like actually trying to find that clarity within themselves and the clarity that, or the reality that people have around them? Like, I don't think any of us really know, but I think that's why how you talk about like a community of understanding rather than just individual understanding, like. Mm -hmm getting to that point, I think we need to all have, try to get this understanding together collectively to make change. Yeah, I think we as human beings love to other things, right? Like, oh, that's, that's, that's not me, that's other, those aren't my issues. But when it comes to disability, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but at some point, some, you will encounter disability in your life. Either you break a leg and it's a temporary disability and you ha now you're going to realize like exactly how inaccessible things are. Or you go through a very hard time. You get diagnosed later with depression. You, I mean, so this idea of like constant othering things and like, oh, that's over there. That's not my issue. That's not my issue. No, it is your issue. And not to, not because it will be your issue. If you, to be a, good person you need to listen you know I, st I tell when I go into the freshman classes I tell them all the time I'm like you know one of the first taglines on my resume is I'm a professional listener and I am I don't give advice unsolicited advice if people ask me of course I will but and I there's no judgment like you can tell me you're struggling with this faculty member I'll try to role play with you we'll do all these things but there's no judgment but People are so eager to fix and find solution, but you can't fix or find a solution until you understand the problem, right? So if we're not listening, if we're not listening to people, like if you want to pop off of that, when you're done here, go check out Alice Wong. Um, it's Visibility Disability Movement. She's amazing. She's doing so much work. She did something with StoryCorps um, on NPR. Like there's so much out there. There's so much out there to, um, to see and it's not it just shouldn't be October just like you know um, February didn't be the only month we're talking about black history I mean this this other ring is kind of what has led us here so yeah. but again a tangent I won't go on that tangent <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a structure and I was trying to make sense of it or like yeah it's big and it's complex <laughs> It is. But having these kinds of conversations and having a show at our small community, those are huge ripple effects. And that's what we should be doing, especially as creative individuals, right? Like, 
in times of turmoil, which I think we can all agree we're in times of turmoil, um, you know, who does society look towards? The artists and the creators. No pressure, anybody, but you know. <laughs> it's true, but it's true. You know, like how did so many of us get through March, April, and May? We binge watch, we binged watch shows or we created art or, you know, we, you know, I collaged from New York Times every Sunday <laughs> to try to make sense of the world. So I think that, you know, there's hope. There's hope. I may be, I'm overly optimistic, but I know good people doing good things. So. Thank you so much, Meg. Thank you so much. Thank you. Montserrat loves and appreciates you. Like, oh, thank you, girl. You do for everybody. Like, it, it doesn't go unnoticed. Yeah. So. Thank you. You're going to make me all weepy. I'm not going to cry on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for all your hard work too it means so very much to me it really really does and everybody else who is helping painting and everything i really appreciate it hell yeah yes we and visibility continues it will not be over just no i think just to also just add i think it'll be staying up another week um okay. but it's also going to become a virtual thing like we have awesome. we're going to be sharing so Look out for that if you haven't gotten to look at it physically in front of it with a mask on and distanced apart from other people. But um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, yeah, no, I think this is exciting and I think everyone should be aware of this. Agreed. Agreed. Cool. Thank you. Thank so you much, Meg. Bye. Bye. Bye.